Hello, my name is Dr. Sydney Freeman Jr. And I am so excited that you're here this afternoon and morning to those on the West Coast. Um, this is Saturday Soul, a presentation that is presented by the Liberation Movement, where our focus is on helping to decolonize the Black mind and empower the Black community. And so we have a special treat for you today. Uh, we have Professor Gloria J. Brown Marshall, uh, who is a professor uh, both at uh, John Jay College, but uh, right now is a visiting professor at uh, Harvard University. But we're going to introduce her a little more uh, later. But if um, uh, those who are watching, I would ask you to share this link with your friends and family. We're going to have an exciting presentation for you today. Also, those who may be watching right now, if you could uh, put your name, put your name and uh, and where you're watching from in the chat, we want to shout you out. So we look forward to uh, engaging you uh, throughout the program. So with that, one of the things that we are committed to here uh, and which helps to frame the work in which we engage in uh, meaning the, the liberation movement is this model of Black transformation. And we want to share that information with you right now with this brief video. The work of the liberation movement is grounded in the Black transformation model. We believe that there is a five-step process that will lead to the advancement of our people. These steps inform all work that we engage in. The first step is decolonization, which we define as the holistic process of letting go of colonial practices, values, and culture, adopting and returning to indigenous ways of knowing and being. In other words, a change of mindset centering African ways of thinking and living. The second step is abolition. We define abolition as being willing to fight injustice and dismantle practices, systems, institutions, and power structures. The third step is revolution. I define revolution as a fundamental change from the status quo that facilitates new ways of knowing, being, and operating. The fourth step is liberation. To be liberated is to be free from forms of spiritual, psychological, and physical oppression and captivity. The last step is sovereignty. When we say sovereignty, we are stating that we will be committed to supporting and or establishing black owned and operated institutions. So we take seriously Romans chapter 12 verse two, where it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Black transformation is our assignment, and we are committed to help liberate our people spiritually, socially, and psychologically through educational initiatives. Yes, yeah, so one of the first steps that the, the, the actually the first step in this decolonization Oh, well, this transformation process is decolonization. And so uh, that's what we're going to do today uh, by telling the real story of the contributions of Black women uh, related to law and policy and other areas. And to help us with that is Professor Gloria J. Brown Marshall, who is a professor of constitutional law at John Jay College in the CUNY New York system. Uh, she teaches constitutional law, race and politics, gender and justice, and social justice classes. In fall of 2022, she was and currently is a resident of, a resident of Harvard Kennedy School Institute of Politics and Harvard uh, Kennedy School visiting professor. Uh, Professor Brown Marshall was a civil rights attorney full-time prior to joining the faculty at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Gloria litigated cases for the Southern Poverty Law Center 
Community, uh, Community Legal Services of Philadelphia and the NAACP LDS. She was a law clerk in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania as well as in the Court of Common Pleas in Philadelphia. She studied political science at the University at the University of I if Ben Dan, she's going to get me for messing that up, but Nigeria. But we are so elated to have her with with us. Um, how I met her is uh, in developing the liberation movement. One of the things that I was really, uh, really wanted to do was to strengthen my uh, the community outreach of this particular uh, ministry uh, slash educational initiative. And with that, I thought it was important to uh, get some more tools. And I entered into a program uh, that was offered by Johnson C. Smith Theological Seminary. And with that, I met Professor Gloria J. Brown Marshall, and uh, she is brilliant. And so I said, we had to get her on the platform and so excited to have her. I also, um, before I transition to bring her on, just wanted to shout out Jessica for, uh, from Detroit. Thank you so much for uh, being with us. Uh, others that are watching, please uh, just put your uh, name and where you're watching from in the chat. We wanna acknowledge, acknowledge you, uh, your presence. So in a second, we will bring on we will bring on uh, Professor Brown, Brown Marshall. Hello. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I am so elated that you are here with us. I couldn't even say your whole bio. That would, that would take up the whole time. So I had to cut it just a little short, but excited to have you know that you're doing so much work there at, at Harvard right now and you're visiting capacity. So for you to take time to be with us and be on this platform, we are humble, humbly grateful for your for your time and your contribution. Well, thank you so much. And, and I thank Johnson C. Smith Seminary for bringing us together because that was a powerful class. Anybody out there looking for um, work around not just uh, the religious aspect of activism, but the activist history and going all the way back to hundreds of years up to present, all different ways of looking at activism in our community is a powerful program. So, you know, once a week on Fridays, Friday afternoons, and you meet great people like this guy right here. Yeah, and, and and so I've had people that uh, were my mentors, and they saw uh, they saw the innovation of that program, and they wanted to be a partner in this in this new cohort. So uh, yeah, so there's a variety of people, and I love to say it is a program that each person that they that they accept into the program, there's no weak links. Everyone is doing uh, wonderful work in their own. Uh, area of expertise. They're just adding uh, uh, a component that will enhance what, what they already bring to the table. And, and we all got something different from it and some things that we, like now, we see the nexus of our work. And so we don't want to, you know, we're a communal people. We don't want to be out there all alone doing this work. And that's one program. You get to meet people who are doing the work and form these relationships like the one that I'm honored to have with you, Sydney. Thank you. Wonderful. So what you what's going to happen is I'm just going to pop something on the screen and then you'll be it'll be just you. So just give me a quick second. OK. Hello. And as was pointed out, my name is Gloria Brown Marshall and I teach constitutional law, race and the law, gender and justice. Um, but I also um, have traveled some and try to connect our racial justice history. So my book is She Took Justice, The Black Woman Law and Power. She Took Justice, The Black Woman Law and Power. So I'm going to be referring to that when I have this, you know, um, overall choosing of certain women in our legal history. 
but also connecting it to the present so that we can better understand um, how we can use our um, our work from our ancestors to help our work today, how um, our uh, background has been so tremendous. Resistance and resilience. Resistance and resilience is just in everything we have done and everything we are doing now and what's necessary for us to go forward, no matter who puts an obstacle in our path. And today I am just so proud of our resistance and resilience. I interact with activists and leaders from other groups as well. And I have to say, hands down, African-Americans have done more. We've keep the fire burning. We're not only doing work for ourselves, but our work encompasses other groups like no other group does. We're always talking about ourselves in combination with other people of color and other oppressed people where I don't really see that in the same way with other groups. And I'll just be honest with you. They may do it a little, but we are uh, foremost in activism, making sure that it's just not us as others, sometimes to our detriment, but I think overall, we're, we just think as a communal people and we should not lose that. You know, this, this thing of just me, I, you know, pulling myself up by my bootstraps and what I need for me and people who look just exactly like me and my family, that's not, that's not our tradition. And that should not be our tradition. Um, we're better together we're stronger together and we should continue our communal spirit. And having said that, she took justice, the black woman law and power um, begins in Angola. And I was in Angola earlier this year and I probably will take our plan to take a trip there again. When we look at the 1619 project before there was a 1619 project and I wrote two books that included 1619 before there was ever a 1619 project um, because 1619 is so important. That is the year that 20 and odd Africans arrived in the Virginia colony. They arrived there from Angola. So, so many people look at the 1619 Project without ever looking at where did these Africans come from? Where were they kidnapped? They were kidnapped from what was called Ndongo. And then the Portuguese attacked the Ndongo people and began to um, you know, kidnap, murder, rape, et cetera, um, put into subjugation of labor, um, the Ndongo people. And so um, the story then starts from North America, Virginia going forward, but I want to begin the story with Queen Nzinga. Queen Nzinga was Princess Nzinga. It's a little girl watching her father, the king, um, or Angola, and that's where they get the name Angola, it's Angola. N-G-O-L-A, that is the, the means the status of the king. And so her father was in Gola. And she used to watch her father navigate a landmass that could have been, this has been estimated, as large as um, New York State, Connecticut, New Jersey. If you think about Idaho and, and Iowa and you put those together, that might be two thirds of the landmass that he was controlling. And under him, of course, because they had their own government, which is another misnomer and a myth that the Europeans brought government in order to these people of color. And that's not true. They had their own government. They had their own Angola king. They had their own hierarchy. And so the leaders of these other regional areas or tribes or ethnic groups would come to the king to settle issues, many ways in which we have our Supreme Court. And so I like to begin with Queen Nzinga as a little girl watching her father navigate the egos, the issues and concerns of Ndongo. And then these Portuguese come first as discoverers, and then later on they come as people attempting to conquer because they wanted not just the riches, but they wanted the, the labor. In the 1400s, the Nicholas V, the Pope, the other popes following him had what there was what was called a papal bull, P A P A L. And this papal bull was one in which they would have an order saying from the Pope and the Pope being the, the um, closest thing to God on earth, 
that this is this statement being made in the statement, this popple bull, the statement by Nicholas V and other popes was that anyone who was not a Christian could be subjugated into labor. And so you had these priests who arrived along with the soldiers and the governors and others who wanted to control this land that is straight across from Brazil. So the Portuguese went into Brazil, then the Portuguese went over across the Atlantic to, um, to Africa. And what we need to understand here, because many of us speaking English as I am right now, believe the English began the slave trade and it's not true. Actually, the English were the most barbaric when it came to the slave trade, but the Portuguese and others began the slave trade in earnest in the 1400s. And the English actually came in the end and then took over the slave trade from these other countries. The reason why this is important is because we need to understand resilience and resistance that is taking place. The resistance was Queen Nzinga as a little girl grows up to be from this little girl watching her father navigate these egos and, and issues of his time, then becomes this person with a mind that was just tremendous, as well as a physical um, need to learn how to battle and do warfare. So she used to watch her older brother as he was being trained to be a warrior and she used to practice in the shadows. She became better than her brother and then a tutor took her on and with her father's permission. Now remember, this is in the 1500s. With her father's permission, she begins to take training to be a warrior. So now not only is she a diplomat from the diplomatic skills she learned from her father, but now she's also a warrior from the tutelage she's gained. And it all comes in handy because in 1662, as the Portuguese have fomented civil war, they have you know um, taken dozens of Africans and now hundreds, and it was going into the thousands. And so um, the uh, Ndongo people were at war with the Portuguese trying to survive. Then there was a civil war that's going on. All this lays the foundation for what I'm going to go through next, and which is so important. In 1622, her brother, now the um, Angola, because the father has died, is afraid to meet with the Portuguese to discuss a peace treaty. He sends his sister in Zinga. So in 1622, Nzinga is meeting with the Portuguese governor de Sousa in Luanda, Angola. They are meeting to negotiate a peace treaty. She arrives as royalty. Her maid servants are there with her. Her brother is afraid of being kidnapped and taken away like so many other, you know, um, Ndongo men have and women and children have been taken away. So he sends his sister, his sister's there. She meets with them as a diplomat. She arrives and there is a mat on the floor. They do not give her a chair. They are on their, these high rise chairs sitting, looking down at her. And she's supposed to sit on a mat on the floor to discuss this peace treaty. The diplomatic skills she has learned come in handy as she looks at that mat. She looks at these people, these men, and their, their robes and all their regalia sitting there smirking, looking at her, waiting for her to sit on the floor. And she <laughs> claps her hands. Her maid servants come and they lean over, put their hands on the ground, put their knees down, and they give their backs to form a chair on which she sits to negotiate this peace treaty. This is 1622. UNESCO recognizes the existence of Queen Nzinga. I've had people say, oh, that's a, that's a nice story. No, this is the truth. This woman existed and there are papers in the archives in Angola. Yes, Angola has archives. Yes, African countries have these different things. They have malls, they have archives, they have all these different things. And I go there to study Queen Nzinga and I'll be returning hopefully to study more about her. What I think is so important as well is to understand when that treaty was breached by the Portuguese, Nzinga when her brother dies suspiciously, becomes queen, leads forces against the Portuguese. And until her natural death at age 80 in 1663, 
She is the foremost warrior attacking the Portuguese. Her name was so feared among the Portuguese, they began to revere her. And that's why they even kept records of Queen Nzinga. And she fought the Portuguese to attempt to stop the slave trade. So we need to understand this is the DNA of those who were taken from Angola to North America, to Virginia in August of 1619 arriving one month after the House of Burgesses, which is the le legislative legal body of the Virginia colony. And we know that these 29 Africans arrived because John Rolfe wrote in his journal as secretary of the Commonwealth of Virginia of these 20 and odd Africans who arrived. So all of this is the groundwork for what happens next of two steps forward, one step back, and how we have this black female, African female um, power that has been the groundwork as our Adam and Eve of African-Americanism for today. So I'm going to go through from there for us to better understand that it's in 1607 that we have the founding of the Jamestown settlement in Virginia. So if you have a chance to journey to Virginia, you should. And because those 29 Africans included men, women, and children, I want us to focus on these women, women such as um, who are going forward, who are being taken from Angola into these um, Virginia, this Virginia colony, because this is the first permanent English settlement in North America. They had other attempts at settlements that were not successful. This is the first permanent English settlement. That's Virginia. And this is where the United States begins. Yes, we're going into Thanksgiving. Many people think it's Massachusetts. No, these Africans arrived in 1619. The Mayflower landed in 1620. We were here before the Mayflower. And there were, of course, many other Africans who were already in North America before 1619, especially down in St. Augustine's in Florida. The reason why we focus on Virginia in 1619 is because that Spanish colony and that Spanish state of St. Augustine's that's now Florida is not the foundation for what became the United States of America. Virginia is. And so don't get your nose out of, out of joint if you're in Florida. I know that people in Florida know that they're colony is older. However, is the Virginia colony that's the foundation that creates the United States of America. And so when we go there, we'll see once again, two steps forward, one step back. Um, when we're in Virginia, for example, we have Mary and Anthony Johnson. Mary and Anthony Johnson, of course, their names were not Mary and Anthony Johnson. What the Portuguese used to do was to change the names of Africans. So the Portuguese priests used to baptize the Africans, take away their African names, give them Portuguese names, put them on these ships and say, based on religion, their, their interpretation of religion, that Africans have to work off of their sins and the sin of being the descendant of Cain or the, the, the Cain slew Abel in the Bible or the descendant of being, you know, of Ham. And so therefore we have to work off these imaginary sins where of course it was just pure hypocrisy, greed and brutality and basic oppression using religion because the expansion into the new world required labor and the Pope and the rest of the church was a part of getting a cut of the proceeds from the expansion into the new world. And so they then had these edicts, as I said, like the Papal Bull that said, oh, you can go ahead and exploit these people as laborers to work off their sins. So you can see how oppression had this religious tenet to it that runs through to today. Um, what it is that could be done to men, women, and children in the name of greed and avarice under the color of God and the abuse of religion. And so Mary and Anthony Johnson marry as Angolans with these new names now anglicized. So it started off, they were like Portuguese names. Then they returned to um, 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 ang anglicized names, Mary and Anthony Johnson, their African names lost to time. And they have a home. They have a homestead of a farm. They have servants 
Mary and Anthony Johnson have African and European servants in the 1600s. And then the legislative body, the House of Burgesses, began to see that the power of the African, the resilience and the resistance is there. So they start passing these laws again and again and again to undermine the progress of the Africans. So the laws that we're seeing today that are being passed, the voting rights or suppression laws that are being passed. This is part of a pattern that has gone on for centuries that as soon as they start to see the rise of people of color, then these laws are put in place. And when the law is not enough, that's when the violence happens. So law and violence has been working hand in hand all of this time to undermine, oppress, murder whenever necessary people of color to prevent them from fully competing with Europeans. And so Mary and Anthony Johnson existed. Their lives have been documented in legal documents. And so they were then forced out of the colony as they could have had a right to vote. They could have had a voice in the colony. And as soon as they gained a powerful foothold, that's when they were forced out. But they did indeed exist after going through all the Middle Passage, finding themselves strangers in the strange land, building this life. As so many others have said, the story goes on and on. And what happens? Law and violence then comes in to undermine that. We also have um, Elizabeth Key. Elizabeth Key is a mulatto, you wonder. So what about the children of the European man and the um, African woman? Her mother is named Black Bess. She is Angolan. And so when she, when Elizabeth is, is um, a teenager, her father, Tom, goes back to England, but leaves her there to be taken care of. And so the person who's supposed to take care of her decides, well, these slave laws, little by little, are being put in place in the colony. Why don't I make her into my slave? And then she can also be a concubine. So at that point, she sues. Yes. So one of the first lawsuits brought is by a black woman in the colony in the 1650s. So we have Queen Nzinga, warrior spirit, Angolan woman. And now we have a woman who's biracial in that colony. She sues for her freedom and the lawsuit goes back and forth. She wins, she loses. They finally pass a law allowing her to be seen as a full person of of equal status as a free person because her her father um actually tom key actually said yeah this is my daughter i'm telling the world that's my daughter they then changed the law that says the status of any child born to an African woman will have the status of the woman. I want also for you to keep in mind, see how, how these things, these diabolical laws are being put in place to undermine the progress and maintain the, the powerful oppression that Europeans wanted based on greed of the tobacco crops. And the tobacco crops were very labor intensive and they didn't have enough white slaves or indentured servants, as they were called, who had to work under contract. And once their contract for the indentured Europeans ended, they had to be set free. They had to work for free when their contract was in place. But after the contract was fulfilled, and it could be 7, 10, 13 years, they, had, they could go on about their business and become competition now for that European. So these European landholders, who are also politicians in the House of Burgesses, want to have perpetual labor who will not become competition. And that's why they begin to pass laws again and again to subjugate the Africans into perpetual labor. The greed, the avarice, and then the religion, of course, plays a role because initially they said no Christian could be subjugated into slavery. But then they said Africans don't have souls. So even if they convert to Christianity, it doesn't count. So I want us to see how much of the foundation, the groundwork that was laid back then is what we're dealing with today. In 1669, for example, a law was passed by the House of, Burg of Burgesses that no African killed, or they used to call it corrected. So if they beat this African to death, that no African who's killed by European will have, as a result of that, a European charged with a felony. I want you to get that. This is 1669. The law is passed that allows for the murder of Africans by Europeans without those Africans, or the, the African seeing, getting justice or and without that European being charged with a felony for murder. That's how long that we have been killed with impunity under law.
By 1680, Virginia passes a law that takes away the right of self-defense. Why? Because in 1676, in Bacon's rebellion, Bacon led this rebellion of poor whites and Africans attacking the elite. And so after that, it was decided they will never allow the working class white and the Africans to combine together. They pass a law that puts that begins to segregate the Africans from the poor whites and also always gives the poor whites a little bit more so that they have an investment in their whiteness over their economic condition. So here we have by 1680, a law passed that said, well, Africans cannot have self-defense. They cannot hold a weapon, sword, gun, or anything in self-defense. They could not lift their hand to fight back a European who was harming them personally or a member of their family, their children, their parents. So the right of self-defense has been taken away from the African. So this whole idea that how dare you actually defend yourself, you're supposed to just let us beat you so we can have um, so many encounters like January 6th, the attack on the Capitol, the attack on the Capitol Police, not one of those people being beaten by those crowds even thought to get their weapon, to even fire in the air as a warning shot. Not one. The only time anyone actually used a weapon against those in January 6th riot is when a white woman was about to attack Michael Pence, vice president of the United States, and then she was shot by, by Capitol Police. But we watch the video time and time again, and we see these people who are armed and taking an oath to protect themselves, protect the Capitol, they have a weapon. They don't use it when it comes to white people. And you see, once again, in their minds, it's proper and good to kill black and brown people but they are not going to harm or treat white people in the same way. So this is hundreds of years of conditioning. Um, also loitering, it became the, so there were free Africans. Remember Mary and Anthony Johnson were free and had land and European and African servants of their own. They passed a law that said that Africans could not have white servants or European servants. They passed a law that basically said, even if an African converts to Christianity, they don't have souls so they can practice Christianity. But because before you could not um, enslave a Christian, it doesn't count as enslavement when an African is enslaved, even if they practice Christianity because they don't have souls. So their conversion is meaningless for the most part. And then they passed laws that said there's no loitering, that even free Africans could not be seen in groups more than four or five at any, any point in time. So you see the foundation of what we're dealing with today, the conditioning of it. But I want us to go forward, remember, it's resilience and resistance. So I want us to think about um, Mumbet in 1781, Mumbet was enslaved in Massachusetts, where I am right now. She was enslaved in Massachusetts with her sister. And she, her sister was beaten. And Mom Beck couldn't tolerate to see her sister beaten. And this, this slave mistress was so mean. She picked up a hot poker. She was going to hit uh, Mom Beck's little sister. And so Mom Beck put up her arm and the hot poker went into Mom Beck's arm down to what they say, the white meat. And so Mom Beck was almost died from this. And she was like so angry. She went out doing the shopping and she heard them proclaiming, you know, this, these um, arguments for freedom against the British. Remember, this is when we were an American colony. So she, Mom Bet, goes to an attorney. Yes, she goes to an attorney and she files a lawsuit with the help of this attorney for her freedom, stating the Constitution says that we're all free, then I should be free. Yes. And in 1781, Mom Bet wins her freedom in a court of law. She changes her name to Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth Freeman. And she says, and I paraphrase, that if she could have spent one minute as an enslaved person and become free for only one minute and then died afterwards, she would have just to be free. I want us to understand that we're using the law because the, the sight of this, this, this sense of humanity for us is so reprehensible that we are using escape. 
We're using the law. We are standing up for our rights. We are resisting. We are resilient people. And we've done this in so many ways, especially as Black women. I want us to talk about, if we can very quickly, some of the institutions that were created early in American history. We're looking at institutions now, like I'm a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, um, founded in 1908. There were other organizations founded, for example, Maria Stewart, who lived in 1803, in 1832, this woman who was a writer, educator, abolitionist, and I'm from my book, writer, education, or abolitionist, addresses the African-American Female Intelligence Society in Boston. Now, remember, this is an organization, an African-American Female Intelligence Society that was already in existence in Boston where I am right now. There was already an existence and she was someone speaking at that program. Um, I want us to talk about the fact that even though white women came together in 1848 in Seneca Falls to create the first um, female convention fighting for their rights, it was of course, black women who decided we wanna fight for our rights as well. They were not allowed to be a part of the Black Women's Program and Sojourner Truth then in 1851 makes that speech, Ain't I a Woman in Ohio, stating to the black to the white women that the black woman is also a woman and should be a part of your program of, of pushing for suffrage. And suffrage was, um, of course, the vote and suffragettes, is, or that's what we call women who are pushing for the vote. Um, so, of course, there are four lawsuits brought by um, Sojourner Truth, four lawsuits, all of them successful. She is a fighter. She's from upstate New York. But each time we've got two steps forward, one step back. Um, Celia, the case in 1856, Celia is 17 years old, but she's younger than that when she is bought in Missouri by this man. And unfortunately, she's sexually abused forced to give birth to his children to the point where Celia says enough is enough. She's got this young man she likes. She just wants to have as an enslaved person. She just wants to have some form of life without working all day and then being raped all night by this um, white plantation owner. He comes to her and says, you know, tonight I'm going to be at your cabin that he built for her over in the corner so he can go, um, you know, rape her without anybody seeing. And one night he comes to her and she says no, which is something, of course, you're not allowed to say as a black woman to a white man during this time. He comes after her anyway. She picks up a log and she hits him with it and she hits him again and again. And she has the anger of any human being and especially a woman who's been repeatedly raped. She beats him to death. Then she chops up his body. She puts the pieces in the fire, burns it up and then buries it. And so when they come looking for him, and it was like, what happened to Robert Newsom, the slaveholder? Sent his um, um, daughters come looking for him, and she uh, is, is, of course, Celia is asked this question, and she says, "I don't know." But the young man she has a fancy for says, "I think Celia knows more than she's saying." They come back, and she's so heartbroken that he would betray her. This young man would betray her this way. She confesses. Now, remember, there's no body. She's arrested. There's a trial. She's not allowed to testify. No person of color, black, white, I mean, black, Native American, uh, Latino, Asian, no person of color can testify against a white person in trial. So she can't even defend herself in trial. A, a jury of all white men, many of them slaveholders, finds her guilty and she is hanged for the death of Robert Newsom. So, as I said, two steps forward, one step back. Charlotte Ray, we just had our Justice Katanji Brown Jackson ascend to the nation's highest court. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson is going to be hearing the affirmative action case on Monday. The one that probably, because we have this conservative cohort on the court, will be rendered unconstitutional as affirmative action goes. Our first black female judge, our first black female lawyer is 1872, Charlotte Ray a graduate of Howard Law School. We need to understand how long Black women have been in the legal profession, 1872. So this marks 150 years. This 
ascent of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson is 150 years after the first black female lawyer passes a bar, Charlotte Ray, who ends from New York City, who, uh, as I said, I'm um, graduated from Howard Law School. We need to understand that it's always been resilience and resistance. We've always been pushing um, after the, the Plessy versus Ferguson case made apartheid the racial law of this land of segregation. In 1896, apartheid becomes the law of the land based on the Plessy versus Ferguson um, segregation case. The, the um, political rights and other rights of black and brown and other people, but especially people of African descent are now crushed under segregation. We rise from that using the NAACP created in 1909 um, from lynchings that involved black women as well. And for example, 1901, we had lynchings of black women. We had 20 lynchings of people, as you know, in Idaho um, itself. We had over 4,000, some people said up to 6,000 barbaric um, murders called lynchings, uh, hangings, people burned alive, castrated, pieces of their body put in store windows. We have pictures of that because they took postcards. They took pictures grinning under hanging bodies, grinning under burning bodies to create postcards to um, commemorate and also to, in their minds, um, justify whatever they've done. Native Americans, uh, Mexican Americans, Black Americans, Asians murdered by whites in this country and immigrant whites murdered by whites in this country as well. But in the face of all that in 1939, we have our first Black female judge, Jane Bolin, Jane Bolin, B-O-L-I-N. And she is in New York surrogate court or family court she is the first black female judge in this country. Of uh, the pushback, of course, um, as we gain more rights and freedoms under law um, with integration cases, desegregating our um, first our universities and then later on Brown versus Board of Education. But as we move into Brown, before we get there in 1951, I want you to remember Harry and Harriet Moore. They're in Florida. Harry and his wife, Harriet Moore. Harriet Moore is an activist and teacher, and so is Harry. They are members of the NAACP. In their homes, Christmas night, 1951, a bomb is placed, and it's presumably placed by the sheriff because they were going to hear and hear it more, M-O-O-R-E, um, had been fighting for their rights and the rights of Black people in, in Florida. A bomb was placed on Christmas night that happens to also be their wedding anniversary, and they were murdered, murdered. One murdered instantly in a sleep, another, you know, hanged on for a few days and then died. We need to understand that Harry and Harriet Moore existed. Their existence needs to be something that's remembered by us. But we continue to fight resilience and resistance because we're fighting for the right to vote. We have Louise Lassiter, and others in 1957. Fannie Lou Hamer, who of course is in, um, in Louise Lassiter is in North Carolina fighting for voting rights. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi fighting for voting rights. We have a fight to stop poll taxes. Yes, there was a time we had to pay taxes before we could vote. We had to actually fight to have the U.S. Constitution amended with the 24th Amendment to end poll taxes, the 24th Amendment to end poll taxes. The literacy test was another one to fight, to continue to fight. I want us to understand that Evelyn Butts and Annie Harper were women in, in Virginia who put themselves on the line to, to fight for poll, to end poll taxes. And, you know, Louise Lassiter fighting to end literacy tests. These are black women who brought lawsuits to try to stop these horrendous things from happening. I want us to understand when we're talking about reparations today, when we're, we're talking about reparations, know that Callie House, yes, Callie House, who began the reparations push in 1894, 1894, what happened to her as she pushed for reparations, her organization grew. She just wanted to have a retirement plan for these enslaved Africans who are now too, too old to work and they had no lives that they could really have home to stay in. I mean, they were just forced out when slavery ended. She wanted to have some type of retirement plan for them. Um, 
Harriet Tubman took in, you know, um, those aged, um, in, infirmed um, Africans who had worked their entire lives for free and had nothing by the time they were older and needed help. And so their, um, their work for reparations is something we should remember. Callie House, we should remember that she was C-A-L-L-I-E, that she was someone who was so necessary to this. So many Black women worked to get us where we are today. Um, Constance Baker Motley, the first um, federal black female um, court judge, first federal court judge, black female federal court judge in 1966. We had appellate court judges, black female appellate court judges. We've done so much. And these names, and, and I have them in my books, I said before, she took justice, the black woman law and power. I think what's so crucial is that these names for each one of them represents tens of thousands of others who are nameless, who are voting rights, um, I think I call them voting rights uh, martyrs. And in my book, The Voting Rights War, I speak of the voting rights martyrs who were killed to gain our voting rights as we go into the midterm elections. I want us to not just have our families vote, not just to have our individuals vote, we know in our circle. We have to get those beyond the people we know we have to put ourselves as a little bit of risk. And I want you to know, yesterday I was in a, a rally around affirmative action. And Justice Clarence Thomas, who was a recipient of affirmative action, has called affirmative action in one of his dissents equal or worse than slavery itself. I believe he's a very confused person, but he may be the one writing the opinion for the affirmative action case the case against Harvard and against University of North Carolina that's going to be heard on Monday morning. She took justice or the voting rights war, any of these books and the many women, that's the important part. The many black women who gave their lives, livelihoods, gave their intellect, gave their, their, their working knowledge, their hands, their gifts, their energy to make this world a better place. They gave without knowing our names, and we need to invest in people we don't know, invest in generations to come, and that's our communal spirit. That's the best of our tradition, and that will get us. But before we were able to have our degrees in place at the table, we had to have the spirit as overcomers. And in God's name, in the name of all that is holy, we are going to overcome. Thank you. Ooh, this was awesome and powerful. Thank you so much for this presentation. I learned so many things. Uh, I'm in the background writing all these notes down and I already have your book, but this was so, it's so enlightening. Um, and as I, it's, it's, it's even more powerful because I'm sitting Right now, I'm sitting in Georgia, the land of my 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 mother's birth, and uh, also uh, close to Atlanta, uh, where Stacey Abrams is running for uh, for governor. Could you talk about maybe any connections of the lineage of work that Black women have engaged in? Uh, that has uh, connects with where we are now and trying to get the first black woman uh, governor seated here in Georgia. Well, I'm going to go very quickly into the 1800s because when black men gained the right to vote in 1870 with the 15th Amendment, white women opposed black men gaining the right to vote before they did. And so they had already um, not allowed black women to be a part of their own suffragettes movement. Black women began a, their own grassroots um, campaign to gain the right to vote that went through the 1800s into the 1900s. So when black when women gained the right to vote in 1920, black women had already started their grassroots organizing. They already had a vision for what they wanted to do politically, and they had already been helping black men in their political process. So we had black men in positions of power as U.S. senators, as U.S. representatives, in state government, lieutenant government, there were all lieutenant governor positions. There were over 4,000 black men from 1870 into 
1896 when Plessy versus Ferguson happened. So you have this mm -hmm. arc of black men and black women working together politically. Yes. Okay, so now black women gain the right to vote. There is an onslaught of violence against black women in order to stop them to have from having their political power and exercising their political power. When Racy Taylor, R-E-C-Y, is raped by gang raped by white men in Alabama, there is a foundation of black women put in place to investigate it. This structure is led by none other than Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks at that time is um, someone who's a, her parents were Garveyites. And so they don't know, they don't understand. Most people don't know Rosa Parks was radical at the time. She led the investigation into the gang raping of, of Racy Taylor. The black women in Alabama had formed that structure left over from the grassroots time before. They continued to form their grassroots structure for the Racy Taylor case. That's the case that's put in place the structure that allows them when the when the uh, Montgomery bus boycott happens, the structure is already there. The wow. structure is also there because you have these African-American women in Georgia that are already structured. And that's why when Georgia, when Martin Luther King comes to Georgia and he starts working on the desegregation cases um, for the schools in Georgia, the same way they had the desegregation cases in Alabama. You don't hear about the Georgia desegregation cases as much because of George Wallace in Alabama stole all the, 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 the air in the room. But there, right. that structure was also, that Alabama structure of Black women was also in place in Georgia for those um, school desegregation cases. And so Spelman and other places, and people don't understand that Spelman, of course, from the, from the 1880s, we had black colleges. People think we just became organized and, and educated as black people in the 1960s and 70s. But black women had led these organizations like that mm. um, African-American Female Intelligence Society. Those organizations have been in place all that time, whether or not it's Alpha Kappa Alpha in 1908 formed then, Delta Sigma Theta, but a lot of the sororities and other organizations were put in place. And so the structure upon which Stacey Abrams, who's from a Spelman grad, Stacey yeah. Abrams, who's like worked in so many different of the of these um, political organizations, she's got the structure there. The, the problem is we're having issues with black men not wanting to support black women. And sometimes I think that's out of jealousy. That's out of the sense that black women are getting more than they should out of the bargain that we've stayed in the back and many times let black men, you know, take the forefront. But the black men didn't turn around and, and say, OK, um, we're going to share this. The last point I'd like to make very quickly is that one of the reasons why black men and black women sometimes butt heads is because we have the most parity. We have the most mm. common experience. In other groups, the black woman, the, the female and the male don't have the exact experiences. But in the black community, we came on the ship together. We were in the field together. We were like part of the what was, you know, black women were lynched, not in the same number, but black women were lynched as well. And so we've been on the battlefield together. So our hurt is in the same place in many instances. And so when we butt heads, it's a matter of, and this is my theory, we've got to like choose your turn this time, my turn next time. If not, then we're trying to get the same things at the same time. But if we will give each other just this idea of, let's talk about your pain on Tuesday, let's talk about mine on Thursday, so that we both have a chance to have our um, voice of our pain because if not, we're always fighting for the same thing at the same time. And instead of looking at that and this divide and conquer that's taking place that white men are using and white women too, to break up our families and break up our community, just understand we're hurting at the same time in the same place. But if we respect that, understand our history and choose, you choose one day, I'll choose another day so that we both have time to, to express our pain. We both have time to express our ideas and our wants. We just have to balance. And I'll give this one quick example. My husband and I used to, my late husband, God rest his soul, used to say, okay, we had different ideas when it came to movies. We would take turns. This is your movie choice. I'm gonna sit there and watch it and be nice. And then next time it's my turn. 
Okay, so so we go back and forth. And I think that's what we have to do emotionally so that neither side feels the other side is taking all of the time, taking all the energy. And we both have um, a sense of that we're being heard and felt and loved. So we're closing in on the end. What you shared was powerful. I know there's uh, there's a whole discussion out there. We can't get all the questions that are in the uh, in the chat, but I know there's a whole discussion about the way in which uh, Stacey Abrams could better address some of the the tangible issues that Black men are bring uh, bringing up. But what I want to do is we're going to give a f a free book to uh, uh, to our audience. So what I'm gonna do is put the ticker there for those who may not have uh, seen it. Uh, just email email us at thelibmovement at gmail.com and you can get your free copy of She Took Justice. We wanna be supportive of Professor Brown Marshall and her work. We are so grateful and thankful for your time. Uh, could you give us, um, the way in which we can reach out to you. And uh, if, if some of our audience wanted to follow up with you, what's the best way in which to uh, engage with your work? Well, I'm on Twitter and that is hashtag G Brown, Brown with an E, Marshall with two L's, G Brown Marshall, G Brown, hashtag G Brown Marshall. I'm on Instagram, G Brown, Brown with an E underscore Marshall on Instagram. And um, uh, my my email address um, is G Brown, no, wait a minute, sorry, no, Brown, <laughs> G Brown, Brown with an E <laughs> dot Marshall at Gmail, G Brown dot Marshall at Gmail. So those are the ways you can get in touch with me. Um, I also want to say, um, yes, we expect a lot from our politicians. We sometimes expect more from our politicians when they look like us than we do than when they don't. But we should make a demand also on the politicians who don't look like us, ask them the question, what is your position on black empowerment? Because that's an important question. We don't want just the crumbs from the table. We are powerful people. We are great allies, loyal allies. We're looking for other worthy allies. We don't have to have a marriage. We just have to have an alliance. So politically, that's what we need to think about. What is in our best interest? And just think about there's so many people that we can help. We need to look beyond ourselves and look beyond our egos. I try to keep my ego to less than 20% and try to get the work done um, that needs to get done in the name of the ancestors and, of course, God Almighty. Well, thank you again, Professor Brown Marshall, for your time with us. Uh, we're going to have a special guest next month um, who will, uh, will share with us information from an environmental uh, perspective. And she was a, also a classmate of both of ours. And uh, I'm going to introduce her now. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Brown Marshall, and we will be in touch. Um, we are going to have in our next program, Hermina Glass Hill, uh, who will, she is a, a uh, black environmentalist and um, she's going to bring a different perspective to our audience regarding some of the issues that uh, impact us from an environmental perspective. Uh, and we're so excited. So mark your calendars for November 26 at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today we will not have, um, today we will not have um, uh, our other program that we usually have at two o'clock uh, on Clubhouse, uh, but we are thankful that you have been with us and want to encourage you to continue to support us. Um, it's because of your donations that we're able to do the work in which we do. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to clo uh, close out, but thank you so much for being here with us. I am the Liberation Movement. 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 My name is Dr. Sidney Freeman Jr. 
and I am the executive director and founder of the Liberation Movement, which is a 501c3 organization that works with those who are liberated and seek to be liberated psychologically, socially, and spiritually through educational initiatives. To continue to provide the high quality programming, such as Saturday Soul, we need your support. Your consistent monthly investment in the movement will allow us to continue to expand on the excellent work that is already started, such as decolonizing the Black Mind curriculum that is already in development. So your gifts of any size uh, via Cash App, Venmo, or PayPal would be a blessing to the advancement of this ministry. Thank you in advance for supporting and joining the Liberation Movement. Please remember to join Sydney, me, and our special guest today on Clubhouse at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time so we can dive deeper into today's topic. See you soon.